All God's people said, amen, amen. How many of you are already blessed just for coming to church? You're blessed. Let's, let's thank Nico and Michael for leading us in worship. Everybody's doing good. Everybody's doing good. How was the parking out there today? Was it okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, 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 good. I want you to look inside your bulletin, if you will. There's a couple of flyers or inserts on the revival, which starts in two weeks. I hope you're ready for this revival. It starts in two weeks, and uh, we're expecting you to be here every night. One of those flyers is for you to hand out. Uh, the other is a prayer calendar for the next 14 days that leads us up to that week of revival. I don't know if you know this, but we have literally thousands of prayer requests that come in from all over the country every single week. Uh, because of our television and broadcast, radio and the internet, people all over the country call in and we actually have a prayer team. If you'd ever be interested in joining that prayer ministry, we also have that about a 60 foot prayer tower out there. You can go up there and pray overlooking the city of uh, Los Angeles anytime you want. But certainly the key to revival is all of us uh, on our knees in prayer, asking God to move during that week. Amen? So please take that prayer calendar and follow along uh, the best you can. And again, starting today, 14 days will take you right up to that week of revival. We want to continue our series. If you're a guest, we've been preaching through uh, the book of 2 Corinthians. And we're actually calling this series 2 Californians. And uh, the reason is that Paul... Uh, when he wrote uh, the letter, 2 Corinthians, uh, to the city of Corinth, the people who lived there in Corinth, thus Corinthians, uh, he could have written that to us uh, here in California. And, and truthfully, anytime you read a letter that like Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, even though it was 2,000 years ago, in essence, he was writing it to us today anyway, because... The Word of God is eternal, and can, can you say amen to that? Amen. We've learned in this series that Corinth, the city of Corinth, is a lot like the city of Los Angeles. It's a big city, multicultural city, a port city, a city that was prone to earthquakes, that had a lot of gods, many gods, many religions. There was a lot of sin and a lot of immorality in Corinth, uh, just like this city called Los Angeles. So when Paul writes this letter uh, to the Corinthians, as you read through it, and I really hope if you've not yet read through this entire letter, because we're going to be in this for the next couple of months, make sure you take time to read through the entire letter. Uh, you will find uh, sprinkled throughout all of it that Paul always gives proof that Christianity is legit that his teachings about Christ are spot on. Because there's always people that come in and try to twist the truth and twist the gospel. And Paul wants this church to know that, uh, that the gospel, as he's preached it, is, is spot on. Now, in our text today, you're going to see a battle between the Spirit of God and the law of God. The law of God, everybody say the law of God, that's the Old Testament. That's, that's the commandments. That's the animal sacrifices, uh, all the rules and regulations of the Old Testament. Then you have what's called the Spirit of God. Everybody say Spirit of God. That's the New Testament, all right? That's grace. It's mercy, forgiveness, redemption. I could sum the entire New Testament up in one word. It would be the word Jesus, all right? So there's this struggle between the Old and the New Testament. I want to speak to you on this subject, to veil or to not to veil, to veil or to not to veil. And there's an outline there in your bulletin. Turn to your neighbor and say, to veil or not to veil. Just let them know what the title is today. <laughs> now, you can understand this back... When Christianity started, all they'd ever really known was Judaism, which is the practice and the following of the Old Covenant. So when, when Christianity got started, you can understand this, in the church, there were always those who came in that kept referring back to the way things used to be, 
the law and the, 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 the regulations, the 613 uh, commandments uh, all together, including things like circumcision, all right? Can you say ouch? Just say ouch, all right? <laughs> Can you imagine you're a grown person and, and you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile, and, and you're living in Corinth, it's a very worldly city, and one day someone introduces you to Christ and you want to become a Christian. So you step forward in church, and uh, they say, why have you come? You say, well, I want to be baptized. Oh, come with us. Uh, first of all, you'll have to be circumcised. <laughs> what? I said I wanted to be baptized. I know, I know, I know, I know but uh, we need you to step into this room first because we've got a little procedure we want to do on you. <laughs> well, what are you talking about? Well, well. Uh, in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, it was a requirement that every Jewish person be circumcised. So you need to be, if you're going to be saved, you've got to be circumcised. You say, well, I, 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 thought, I thought this was a New Testament church. Well, it, it is a New Testament church, and, and we, believe, we believe in the New Covenant, but we also believe in the Old. So, so come with us. So uh, that was the struggle. Uh, Paul, in chapter 3, he makes it very clear, very clear, he does this through the whole book, that we're not saved according to that old law, the old covenant, and its regulations. We're saved by the Spirit of the Lord. Not by the law, but by the Spirit of the Lord, which is Jesus. So take your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I want to tell you a story that Paul, uh, as he writes... Uh, he goes back to a story that did take place in the Old Testament. And it's a supernatural moment in time with Moses. And Moses is considered to be the chief lawgiver. So whenever you talk about the law and the Spirit of God, you know, Moses is going to be involved in that scenario somewhere. Now, you should know this story that I'm about to tell you. They certainly knew the story. It was where the Israelites had been in bondage uh, in Egypt for 400 years. It's a long time. And God used Moses to deliver 1.5 million Hebrews out of Egypt and began that process of leading them to the promised land, the land, of Israel, the land we know today is the land of Israel. And of course, if, you've, if you have one and a half million people, you, you do have to have some rules and some regulations and some laws or there's going to be chaos. So Moses is leading the children of Israel and they stop for a while and there's a mountain and God is up on that mountain. So Moses, you know this story, you should know this story, he, he goes up the mountain to meet with God. And while he's up there on top the mountain, uh, God takes his finger and he, he writes out and carves out on tablets, uh, tablets of stone what we know today as the Ten Commandments. And he hands these commandments to Moses, and he says, Moses, go hand those to the people. So Moses, here he is, he's, he, he's been with God, and now he's coming down the mountain, and he has these, these commandments with him, all right? These are going to guide the people, the God's people. And while he's coming down the mountain, if you look, his face, the Bible says this, because he'd been in the presence of God. The Bible says that his face was like glowing like the sun, like you couldn't even look at it, all right? So as he's walking down the mountain, the people back in those days, you see, they didn't have, they didn't have Oakleys. You know, today we're outside, I'm in the sun, I can't see, I put these on, I can see. Back in those days, they didn't have glasses like this. So as he's coming down the mountain, the people are looking at him, his face is just glowing, and they can't even look. So Moses, according to the Bible, he gets what's called a veil. Now, a veil is basically just a scarf or handkerchief of some sort. And the Bible says, again, he takes the veil and he puts it over his face like this. All right? Now just, just picture me being Moses for a little bit. <laughs> the question is why? Why did he put this veil? I'm talking to you on this subject, to veil or not to veil. Why did he put the veil over his face? For two reasons. Number one, write this down. His face was too bright. Now, none of you have this problem. 
we tend to be a little grumpy at times. Sad sometimes. Moses came down off that mountain after being in the presence of God. His face was glowing. And I, I, I didn't say this last night because they, they're not mature enough to handle it. But <laughs> um, I read this this week. If, you, you know what a lightning bug is? And it was a funny quote. It said, if God can light the bottom of a bug, he can light your face as well. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> That's terrible. Okay. So the second reason, his face, he, you know, they didn't have sunglasses, so he just, the people couldn't even see him, so he wore the veil. But the second reason, this is very important, and everyone skips over this. His glory, that brightness, was fading. It was fading. You say, well, why, if it was fading, would he continue to wear the veil if it was fading? It was because he didn't want the people to know it was fading. He didn't want them to know. Whenever he got near to God, his face would begin to blow, to glow from just being in the presence of God. But whenever he left the presence of God and he made his way down the mountain and he got further and further away from God, no longer in God's presence, the glory would fade. Don't forget that. So we come to chapter 3. There's this battle between the old and the new covenant. Paul wants the people to know you think, you think that Moses' face glowing was something amazing? He said, let me tell you something even more amazing than that. Number one, write this down in your notes. That the ministry of the Spirit of the Lord is even more glorious than what you saw when you saw Moses' face. And when you see in the Bible where it says it's more glorious, the word glorious means that it's superior. Doesn't mean that it's brighter, it just means that it's superior in every way. Now, I want to read through this, and you're going to see, uh, and again, they knew this story, so when, when he's writing this, they, they knew exactly what he was talking about. So let's look at verse 7, and we're going to eventually read the rest of this chapter today. The Bible says, now, if, everybody say if. If the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, it came with glory, Moses' face, so that the Israelites could not steadily look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, still glory, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even what? more glorious. Now, in that day, and those regulations and those rules, all of it only proves that you can't keep them. The law only proves that you are guilty. Most of you, and this is true, broke the law in the church parking lot just getting into church. <laughs> just, just, that's all rules do is they prove you can't keep them. But even with the laws, even in that period, there is still glory. Moses still came down that mountain. His face was still aglow. He did meet in the present, with the presence of God. And even though it was fading, there was still glory there. But he wants you to know that the Spirit of God is even greater glory than that glory. Look at verse 9 and 10. He says, if the ministry that condemns men, that's the Old Testament, if that's glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And then verse 11 reads, and if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which last forever. Can you say amen? amen? 
Don't forget that Moses' face, that glory, it faded as he came down off of that mountain. It diminished when he left the presence of God. And Paul wants the church to know how much greater, how much superior is the glory that you receive when you receive the Spirit of God that doesn't fade, it never fades, that it lasts forever. You see, you've got to learn that once you become a Christian, God puts his presence inside of you so that wherever you go, if you go to the right, if you go to the left, if you go up, if you go down, if you go this way, if you go that way, it doesn't matter. God's presence is within you. God does not live up there on the mountain where Moses would go up. Oh, no, he'd be around that for a little bit, and as he got further away from God, the glory would fade. No, the day you become a Christian, and you'll learn this in chapter 5, verse 17, and in chapter 6, verse 16, the Bible talks about how your body is the temple, and God puts his spirit, his presence that comes to live inside and dwells within that temple, so that wherever you go, you're always in the presence of God, always. And his first point is that the glory of the new covenant is greater than the glory of the old covenant. The second point, write this down, only in Christ, oh, this is important, only in Christ is that veil taken away. The veil is in place. It's there. The glory, of God, it's there. The Old Testament, the regulations, the rules, the commandments, they're there. But only in Christ is that veil ever removed. Stay with me. Let's look at verse 12. Therefore, everybody say, therefore. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. Verse 14. But their minds were made, what's the word? Dull. For to this day, to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is just read. You just read it. It's still there. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. I'll explain that. Verse 15. Even to this day, when Moses is read, what does that mean when Moses is read? It means when you read the laws of Moses, the law of God, when you read the Old Testament. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is what? The veil is lifted. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is not difficult to understand. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the Old Law, there is something depressing about it. It's discouraging. Just to, re just to read it is discouraging. I will tell you what happened to almost every single person in this room who decided for the first time, and many people do this, they say, I've never read the Bible. I think I'm going to read the whole Bible just so I can say I read through the whole Bible. And I'm going to start with the very first book, the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm going to read through the whole Bible. And so you start with Genesis, and it's pretty good because you read the story of creation how God spoke and created the heavens and the earth, and he made the birds of the air and the, and the fish of the sea, and, uh, and then he made man, and then he took a rib out of the man, and he made a woman, and they're both naked, and uh, they're in the garden, and everything's perfect, and then the serpent comes along and tempts one of them, and they, they both eat of the fruit, and so God kicks them both out of the garden, and then after that, you get to read the story of Noah, how the entire world was wicked, and, and God told Noah to build a bar, uh, an ark, and so Noah builds an ark, and he takes two, uh, two animals of every kind, puts it on, the, and it rains for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards, God puts this big rain up in the sky and that rainbow says that God is never going to destroy the world again by water and then you get to read the story about Abraham and oh that's a great story how he takes his son Isaac to go up and sacrifice him on the altar and then the last 15 chapters of Genesis is the story of Joseph that's the greatest story in the whole world story of Joseph and you get to read that and then you turn the page and you come to Exodus <laughs> and 
And then Leviticus. <laughs> and then you read the book of Numbers. <laughs> and then you just quit reading. It's what 99 out of 100 of you did. Why? Because there's no joy. It's just rules and regulations. And then just, just, just reading it, just reading it. Not you're not even doing it. You're just reading it weighs you down. It's like an anchor. It's oppressive. And you realize that no one could keep all those rules, especially you. And then one day, you got to the New Testament, and it dawned on you that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament scriptures and all of those Old Testament laws. And when you get to, when you get to Jesus, that veil is removed, that the, that the law is not what saves, but Jesus is what saves. And it's so refreshing. And then you read that story in Matthew chapter 27 where Jesus, the, the sinless sacrifice, he dies on the cross. And the Bible tells us in Matthew 27 when he says the words, it is finished, and he breathes his last breath, and he dies, that in the temple, that there was a veil that kept all of us out of the Holy of Holies where God lived. And the Bible says that when Jesus died, that that veil was torn in two, thus allowing all of us to now be able to live in the presence of an almighty God. Oh. The veil, I want you to write this down. The veil is really anything that keeps you from knowing God completely. I mean, some of you here today, your veil is the fact that you're trusting in your good works to get you to heaven. And you believe if you do enough good deeds that somehow God's just going to let you in. And so that's your whole life, your whole uh, religious belief system is built on you just every day getting up and doing good things. That will wear you out. Some of you, your veil is thinking that, and this is true, some people think that, that you, you, you can't, it's not possible to know God. It's just God is too big and too great and too powerful, too far away, and that here on earth, that we, no, no one ever really knows God. Some people don't even believe there is a God. That's your veil. That, that's what's keeping you. You don't even believe that there's a God. Maybe it's your doubts or your fears. Some of you, you're holding on to something, and you're so focused on something that you can't even see God because you're just so wrapped up in something that's temporary, but you don't even know that it's temporary, and you miss the eternal. The bottom line, according to verse 16, that salvation only happens when someone turns to Jesus. And only in Christ can the veil be removed. Number three, write this down. The Spirit of the Lord. Don't forget, you've got the law of God and you've got the Spirit of the Lord. It's the Spirit, not the law. It's the Spirit that brings freedom. And the Bible says in verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That word in the Greek, eleutherea, means liberty. You write that down, liberty. That's the ability. We know what that word liberty is because we live in the United States of America. It's the word that means to live your life without constraints. That's what makes this country great is that you're able to live without being enslaved, although we're becoming enslaved more and more in this country. If you ever make the jump, if you ever decide you're no longer gonna live according to the Old Testament law, 
And you're never going to, again, understand that you're going to live underneath all those rules and all those regulations and all those animal sacrifices and having to be uh, circumcised and having to be condemned by the fact that you can't keep those laws. And you ever make the jump from that over to the Spirit of the Lord and you become a Christian and you understand now grace and forgiveness and peace and freedom, you will feel as though you just got out of jail is what you'll feel like. So you don't misunderstand, and people misunderstand all the, all the time, because you know, I talk to a lot of people. There are people who say, I don't want to become a Christian because you all have too many rules, too many regulations, too many stipulations. The, uh, your to-do list is too long for me. Why? If I become a Christian, I won't have any fun anymore. <laughs> so they reject Christ, thinking that he is going to keep them from having fun. But ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that Christ is the one that frees you. He's the one that liberates you from your past. He frees you from that which binds you. He delivers you from your addictions. He cleanses you from your sin. He releases you from your debt and your guilt of sin. The very opposite is true. Before you meet Jesus, before you know Jesus, before you love Jesus, you are currently living in bondage to the things of this world. You are tied to your past. You are chained to your sin. You're being choked by your addictions. You're in bondage to this world and the ways of this world, and you don't even know it. And if you give your life to Christ, he will free you from all that, and then you'll be able to live life as life is supposed to be lived. Notice again that verse, chapter 3, verse 17. Paul says, the Lord is, is, he's not a law. He's not a rule. He's not a regulation. He's the Spirit. And wherever the Spirit is, there is, in the words of Mel Gibson in the movie Braveheart, there is freedom. <laughs> I was on a golf course one day all by myself. And uh, sometimes I like being by myself. You all know that, right? Yes. You all know that, right? It's, it's not that I don't love you. But sometimes I just need some alone time. And so I was on a golf course all by myself. The world was perfect. The sun was shining. The birds were chirping. There was a breeze, the flowers were blooming, and uh, I was just having fun. And uh, all of a sudden, I, I'm playing, I, I had to slow down, because out in front of me, there was a, uh, I finally caught up, there, was, there were two girls in a golf cart right in front of me, and they were slow. So now I have to wait. I have to hit and wait, just wait. I'm, I'm watching, I'm seeing them, they're just, they're just doing nothing. <laughs> what, are you, what are you guys doing up there? I'm thinking to myself, they're doing nothing up there. I wait, I wait, I wait. And finally they look back and they go like this, which means I get to play through, go, go around them. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> and as I, as, I, as I get to play through, uh, I had to drive by them. I, I, I said, thank you, thank you. And uh, the two, two ladies, and, and the lady goes, she goes, she, she, I don't know them, they don't know me. She, she goes, you want a beer? <laughs> and I did, I just, I just paused. I was like, no. <laughs> so are you sure? See, they've been drinking all day. They've been drinking. It's just, that's, that's why they're, just, they're not playing golf. They're just out there drinking. <laughs> are you sure you don't want a beer? 
We've had two already. <laughs> We've got plenty. That's what they said to me. And I said, no. <laughs> and I, I didn't want to get in the fact that I was a preacher. <laughs> but I said to those girls, because I just couldn't help myself. And some of you don't even, some of you won't even understand what I'm saying. But I said to them, I, I said, I said, I, I said to them, I said, I said, <laughs> I said, you're not going to understand this, probably. I said, but I, 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 I don't drink beer, and I've never in my entire life ever felt like I needed a beer to have fun. In fact, in fact, I honestly believe that if I took that beer, I'd stop having fun. And they just kind of looked at me as I drove on past them. They did not know what to think about that. Jesus said these words in John 8, verse 34. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, that everyone who sins, now hear this, everyone who sins, you are a slave to that sin. You don't even know that you're enslaved. You, 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 some of you, you can't go one day without your drug, without your alcohol, without whatever that sin is. And there, you, again, you don't know that you're enslaved to it. Becoming a Christian, if you become a Christian, it's not a burden. It's not hard. It's not burdensome. God actually frees you from everything this world is trying to enslave you with. He said, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins becomes a slave to that sin. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand that. Then he said in verse 36, so if the Son sets you free, so he's not really going to free me from, if the Son sets you free, Jesus said, you will be free indeed. Don't question, don't doubt God's ability to free you from every addiction through the blood and power of Jesus Christ. Let's go to point four before I get in any trouble. Point number four. We are being transformed, everybody say transformed, into his what? His likeness. Now, now th this here is the good stuff. Have you ever gone to church and wanted the good stuff? Turn to your neighbor and say, this is the good stuff. I, I, I did, I, 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 you don't know this, but when I'm working all week on the sermon, I wanted to spend the whole sermon just on this one verse. But I couldn't skip all that other stuff. Could I say no? So I got to talk about this, but not as long as I want to. This is the good stuff. Look what he says in verse 18. This, this might be one of the most important verses in the whole Bible. It's a big book, and you're here today to hear this verse. We, who with unveiled, and how does the veil come off? Only in Christ. So he's talking about people that are in Christ, and you're no longer underneath the laws and the rules and the regulation of the Old Testament, but you have found your freedom in Christ, he says, we who with unveiled faces, all of us, reflect, and that word reflect is a word that, that uh, it's like a mirror, that it's just, just when you look in a mirror, a mirror reflects. All of us who are saved, who have unveiled faces, living in Christ, all of us, all of us, like a mirror, we reflect the Lord's what? Glory. And when you see the word glory, it, it, you can replace and put the word character. We, we reflect the Lord's character. Just like, just like when Moses went up on that mountain and he was in the presence of God, his face was like a mirror that reflected as he came down off that mountain, it reflected the glory and the character of the God, the holy God that he'd been in the presence in when he went up on that mountain. Are you with me? 
So all we who with unveiled faces, all of us, we reflect the Lord's character. We are being transformed into his likeness. Oh, don't, don't lose this next line. With ever increasing glory. When Moses came down off that mountain, his glory was fading because he was walking away from the presence of God. But when we have our veil removed and we are in Christ, all of us reflect the glory of the Lord. We're being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit, of course, who lives within us. And I love the New Living Translation. Look at these words of this verse. As the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more and more and more and more like Him, and we reflect His glory more and more and more. That's the goal. The Spirit of the Lord that is within you is transforming you into being just like Jesus Christ and wherever you go, you are reflecting the glory and the character of God, and that glory is increasing. It never fades as a child of God. The Spirit of God in you transforms you into the likeness and the character of Christ. Now, as we close, write this down. And uh, I, I'm, 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 you, you might think I'm switching gears, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm trying to teach you something. There's a difference between being a believer and being a disciple. Do not leave here today until you understand the difference. A believer is someone who has the knowledge and the faith, and they believe that Jesus died, that Jesus was buried, and that Jesus resurrected. How many of you would say, I'm a believer? You believe that. Just raise your hand. I won't even look. Raise your hand. You, you're, you're a believer. But being a believer, there's a big difference between saying, yeah, I believe all that, and becoming a disciple of Christ. A disciple is someone who every day of their life, they get up. And they want to become more like Christ. They want to talk like Christ and walk like Christ and act like Christ. See, a believer, you can believe and come in here. In a few moments, you can leave and nothing's really changed about you. That's, that's why you confuse people that are out in the world. You call yourself a Christian? Yeah, I believe. There's a difference between believing and becoming a Christ follower, becoming someone who understands that God placed his spirit inside of you, and that that spirit every day is in the process of transforming you and turning you in into the character and the integrity of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's the, it's the spirit of Christ. It's the spirit of God. It is Christ in spirit form who lives within you, and it doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes it's a process, but it's a, it's, a, it's a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly process of every day you are becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. And the more you become like Jesus Christ, the more you reflect his character to those who are watching. I heard a true story of a woman who went to a diet center. She wanted to lose some weight and get in shape, and so the director took her over to a full-length mirror and made her stand right in front of it. And the director took a marker and on the mirror outlined a thinner figure and told her, this is what I want you to be at the end of our program. So weeks of intense dieting and exercise followed. Every day the woman would stand in front of the mirror discouraged because her bulging outline didn't fit the director's goal. 
But eventually, she didn't quit. She kept at it. And after a lot of exercise and a lot of good dieting, she finally stood in front of that mirror and conformed to the longed-for image. Stay with me. Our idea is Christ. And when you put yourself next to his perfect character, it reveals how out of shape we all are. Being transformed into Christ's image, it takes a while. You have to accept Christ and his presence and his spirit. You have to begin to develop a relationship with him. You begin to fall in love with him. You understand that he's walking with you and he begins to shape you and he begins to mold you. And after a period of time, you look up one day and all of a sudden you are reflecting the image of Christ. And his glory begins to shine through you and that glory will shine through you forever and ever and ever, it's a glory that never fades. <laughs> write this down as quickly as you can write. I, I mean, you gotta take like 30 seconds to write all four. You can do it, you can do it. You gotta make sure you're saved. You gotta make sure you're in Christ, all right? If you're not saved, <laughs> you gotta start there. Come today and give your life to Christ. Make sure you've surrendered to Christ. You're not just a believer, but that you wanna be a disciple, and you're gonna surrender to him. Number three, make sure you get in the scriptures. Study God's word. Read it every day. Come to church. Get involved in a life group. Keep your nose in the Bible. And number four, allow the Spirit of God to sanctify you. Allow the Spirit of God to sanctify you. Let's stand and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father God, many of us here today, many of us are in bondage to the things of this world. We have a head knowledge, but we have never been set free from our past from our guilt, from our addictions. And Lord, I really believe that we have to understand that Moses' face, that glory was diminishing as he left the presence of God. He didn't want anyone to know it. And we're just like that. But I pray today that we realize that we don't have to go up on a mountain that we just have to accept Christ into our life and at that moment that he puts that spirit within us and that spirit begins that process of sanctification. Where every day he walks with us. He talks with us. He teaches us and he leads us. And even when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, he is there with us. And wherever we go, he's just shaping us and molding us and transforming us into his image. And I pray that we would desire here today not just to be a believer, but we would desire today to become a disciple of Christ. And Lord, today, if there's anyone here today who needs to be set free and they just feel like they're living in bondage every single day, maybe to some sin or to depression or to some uh, thing that causes anxiety, to fear, whatever it is that's, that's, that's holding them down like an anchor around their neck, God, help them to come today and to be set free from those things. And as Jesus said, once I set you free, you will be free indeed. But all that happens when we come to Christ. And so I pray as we sing today, from every aisle there would be those who would come and just simply walk down here to front and just say, I want, I want my life, I want to be in Christ, and I want Christ to set me free. 
And I believe if we'll make that decision that he will indeed set us free. We ask in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.